All right, today we want to learn as much about definite integrals as we possibly can, okay? And the basics of their applications. So, so far what we've been talking about is applications to physics. If you know the speed, you can integrate that to find the distance traveled. I'll continue emphasizing that here today. But I also do want to emphasize one other main kind of application. And that kind of application is to probability. Um, something called normal curves and other similar kinds of things are worth emphasizing, I think, as an application of integrals. Again, the topic is not indefinite, but definite integrals. We will probably still look at parametric curves some more. I'm not sure if we'll have time for that today. Maybe Wednesday instead. Let's just focus as much as we can on integrals themselves. We're given a function, I'll go ahead and write y equals f of x. Though keep in mind for many of our applications, y equals f of t is the more typical thing we might be doing. We might be typically using t as the independent variable because t will represent time. But here in this general setup, I'm going to let x be the variable, though x could still represent time. It still could represent time. And we want it to be a, a fairly nice function. Continuous is certainly nice enough. You can actually get away with less than continuity. You can get away with a finite number of what are called jump discontinuities, but let's just keep it simple here and say it's continuous on the closed interval from A to B like that, including the endpoints. For the sake of simplicity, for the sake of simplicity here initially, assume this graph is never negative. This function is never negative. Assume f of x is greater than or equal to zero for all x in the closed interval from a to b. We're just going to do that at first. We will, we will allow negative function outputs here, maybe even still today. But here initially, it's going to be simplest to assume the function is never negative. So its graph is always above the axis. Our goal, geometrically speaking, is to find the area under the graph. Find the area under the graph of y equals f of x for x between a and b. So if the graph happens to look like this, our goal is to find this area. That's what the goal is. Why? Well, it turns out areas have lots of applications besides just finding areas. I mean, maybe the most basic kind of applications of areas is to like size of plots of land and stuff like that. But areas turn out to have a lot more application than figuring out how big your, your land is. Turns out a lot of applied situation, finding, situations, finding the area under the curve solves a problem that you would nece not necessarily know would be solved by an area. For example, if this graph was the speed, we pretended X was time and Y was the speed, that area would be the distance traveled, it turns out. Now, there's something called the fundamental theorem of calculus that makes doing this 
achieving this goal in many situations is actually very simple. The fundamental theorem of calculus, amazingly, allows us to solve this general problem in many situations with a pretty simple technique in the big scheme of things. However, before we get to that, we need to pay a price. What kind of price do we have to pay in calculus? Well, what kind of price have we paid before with derivatives? Before we could use the product rule, the quotient rule, the chain rule, et cetera, we had to pay a price of computing limits because that's how derivatives were defined. The limit definition of the derivative. Do we have to pay the price here? Technically, yes. We have to and try to answer the question with limits. Let's go ahead and do that. What I'm about to do with the limits is worthwhile, not just for understanding where the integral comes from, but also because it helps you with the problems where you're approximating integrals based on data as well. So let's take an example here. Let's let f of x be x squared. And let's let the interval from a to b, oh, let's be from two to five. That's my interval from a to b. First step is to break this interval from A to B up into a certain number of sub intervals. Let N be the number of sub intervals that I'm gonna break the big interval from A to B into. Now, I'm not saying what n is. I could certainly pick something specific for n. <clears throat> I could let n be 10, for example. Question? So you're not getting the screen share? No, no, we didn't Oh, my, okay, my, thanks. Okay, sorry. I was thinking you meant my camera paused. Thanks. Let n be the number of sub intervals from A to B. I could pick n to be, for example, 10. If n were 10, think with me here. If I broke this interval that's got length three, it goes from two to five. If I broke that into 10 pieces of equal length, how long would each of those pieces be? Well, the total length of the interval is five minus two is three. Three divided by 10 is 0.3. Each sub interval will be of length 0.3 in that case. If I let n be 100, I divide this by 100. Three divided by 100 is 0 0.03. So I certainly could pick a specific value of n, and I think we will, but not here in this setup. It's worth doing the abstract setup here. Once you've chosen the number of sub intervals, then you define the length of each sub interval, call it delta x to be b minus a divided by n. b minus a is the length of the whole interval. Five minus two in this case, which is three. The next thing you do, is you define x sub i, what is x sub i going to be? x sub i is going to be, well, there's a couple ways to think about it. Probably simplest to call it the right endpoint of the ith interval. So x1 will be the first, the endpoint of the right endpoint of the first interval. x2 will be the right endpoint of the second interval. 
x3 will be the right endpoint of the third interval. It turns out the general formula for this is a plus i times delta x. Which in our case simplifies to two plus i times three over n. Two plus three i over n. You can do this though, even though when, when i equals zero. You can do this when i is zero, one, two, three, et cetera, up through n. Think about this with me. So x zero, if you plug in i equals zero is two plus zero, right? If you plug in i equals zero right there, you get zero. Plug in i equals one, you get x one to be two plus three over n. i is one, three times one is three over n plus two. If i is two, you get two plus six over n. Right? If i is two, three times two is six. If i is three, you get two plus nine over n, et cetera. If i is n, what do you get? What does that simplify to if i equals n? Right there, where I'm pointing. Five. Five, exactly. The n's would cancel, you'd be left with two plus three is five. Xn is five. The right endpoint of the interval. This was the left endpoint, this was A. This is the right endpoint, that's B. It's not an accident. <clears throat> Remember what the goal is. The goal is to approximate the area under the graph. Now the actual graph of x squared looks about like this. This point is two comma two squared. This point here is five comma five squared. I'm trying to approximate the area under the graph, I'm trying to find it exactly actually, but initially I do that by approximation. And remember, like we talked about last Friday, that means uh, for the uh, sub intervals here, for each sub interval, I'm going to go to the right endpoint, use that point to go up to the graph of the function, and use that as the top of my approximating rectangle. When I do it with the right endpoints like this, this is called a right hand sum. The last one's going to look like this. Right hand sum RHS. Sometimes I use for right hand side, but here I mean right hand sum. It's going to depend on n. <clears throat> if I write it out, it'll be well, think about it here. The area of this first triangle is going to be f of x1. Plug x1 into the function to get the height times the base times delta x. That's the area of the first rectangle. Delta x is the base, f of x1 is the height. Area of first rectangle. The area of the second rectangle. Here's the second interval right here where I'm pointing. Take its right end point, go up to the graph, use that as the height of the approximating rectangle. The base is still the same, it's still delta x, but the height is now f of x2. Area of the second rectangle. Plus f of x3 times delta x. That's the area of the third rectangle, etc. The last rectangle, call it the nth rectangle, has an, a base still of delta x and a height of f of xn. That's the area of the third. The 
This would be the area of the nth rectangle. I can write this to a summation notation, capital sigma. And this is something you should work at being comfortable with. Many people feel uncomfortable when they see that sigma. It just means summation, add things up. I starts at one and goes up to n. It's assumed when I write this that i is one first, then two, then three, then four, et cetera. And the last value of i is n. F of x i times delta x. But wait a minute, what is x i? And what is delta x? Delta x is three over n, that goes right there. X i is two plus three i over n, that goes right there. And F is X squared. I need to use that. I'm going to do this in two ways for a particular value of N. I'm not done with the steps here, by the way. Let's just consider an example. For example, Suppose n equals four. That'll mean delta x is three over n is three fourths, 0.75. It'll mean x one is a plus delta x a is two, two plus 0.75 is 2.75, x2 will be a plus two times delta x, two plus two times 0.75 is 3.5, x2 will be another 0.75 added onto that, that'll be 4.25, and x, that, excuse me, that's x3, and x4, will be another 0.75 added onto that, that's five. If that is the example, then we need to find F of 2.75 times 0.75, that's F of X1 times Delta X plus F of 3.5 times 0.75, plus f of 4.25 times 0.75, and then finally plus f of five times 0.75. And if I do that, that should be an approximation to the area under the graph. It should be an approximation to this thing called the integral, which I haven't bothered writing the symbol for yet. F of x again is x squared. That's the function right here. So when I plug these numbers into F, I need to square them. 2.75 squared times 0.75. This first number is 5.671875. Next one, I need to do 3.5 squared times 0.75. 9.1875. Go to the next one, do 4.25 squared. See how I'm plugging these all into the function and then multiplying times delta x. This is 13.546875. And finally, the last one is five squared is 25 times 0.75 is 18.75. Now add these numbers up. 5.671875 plus 9.1875 plus 13.546875 plus 18.75. 47.15625 is my right hand approximation to the integral when n is full.
That's my approximation to the area under the curve. It's going to be too big because the function is increasing. Therefore, these right-hand sums, these rectangles are above the curve. Their areas are too big. But you hope it's not too far off. You might hope the answer is at least in the 30s, maybe the 40s. Hang with me here. Keep your focus. Um, let's find this sum another way. I'll call it step five. Let's do it symbolically. This is now step five. I'm going to simplify the right hand sum. Simplify. Remember what it was, it was the summation, the capital sigma just means add f of xi times delta x. Remember xi is two plus three i over n, so I got to plug that into f, I've got to square it. Two plus three i over n squared. That's f of xi. times delta x. Delta x is three over n. Let's try to simplify this. Delta x there. Expand that square out and then use the distributive property for the three over n. Let's expand the square out first. I'm foiling in my head. I'm multiplying this binomial times itself. So I got to imagine another copy of it. First times first would be two times two is four. Focused here, outside times outside and inside times inside would both be six I over N. And you'd have two of them. So you'd really get plus 12 I over N. And then last times last is three I over N times itself would be nine I squared over N squared. Now distribute this three over N through the parentheses. Three over n times four is 12 over n. 12 i over n times three over n is 36 i over n squared. And nine i squared over n squared times three over n is 27 i squared over n cubed. Just leave the summation sign there. Now it's a property of summations that when I have the sum of a linear combination, it's the corresponding linear combination of the sums. Now, what does that mean? Let me do it in two steps. I can first write this. You might wonder why can I do that? And how would I know that I could do that? Well, you would know you could do it because I tell you, you can do it. It's almost as if you're distributing the summation sign through the parentheses as if it were a number, but the summation sign is not a number. It's a, it just means add. But that is a true fact that you can do this. Um, if you were looking for a justification of it, it's basically equivalent to saying um, something like this, A1 plus B1 plus A2 plus B2 is the same as because of really the, what's called the associative property and the commutative property. It's the same as A1 plus A2 plus B1 plus B2. That's, that's essentially what I'm doing here, except with abstract symbols that have an arbitrary number of terms in them in the summation rather than just two big terms here. 
this thing here is like summation i goes from one to two of ai plus bi. This thing is the summation i goes from one to two of ai. And this one is the summation i goes from one to two of bi. And I'm adding those results. So I'm saying this summation equals the sum of these two summations. It's really the associative property and the commutative property that allow you to do that. <clears throat> Boy, this doesn't look so pleasant, but hang on, it can be done. This summation right here is a lot easier than it looks. In fact, the 12 over N doesn't depend on I. You, if you want to think of N as fixed, that's just a number that I keep adding to itself N times. I could factor that 12 out over N out in front and I'm left with a summation I goes from one to N of one. Because 12 over N times one is 12 over N. That's what I'm really factoring out of 12 over N in this summation. here. And with the next summation, there is an I in there. I can't factor out the I because the summation depends on I. I is a variable. But I can factor out the 36 over N squared because that doesn't depend on I. And with the last one, I've got an I squared that needs to stay there, but everything else that does not involve an I, 27 over N cubed can be factored out. This one right here means add one to itself n times. Add one to itself n times. One plus one plus one plus one plus dot 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 plus one. What is one added to itself n times equal to? What would one be added to itself 10 times equal to? It's just equal to n. 10. Go ahead and say it louder. Is it just equal to n? Yeah, this equals n. Just like one added to itself 10 times equals 10, one added to itself 20 times equals 20, one added to itself n times equals n. And that n will cancel with this n. That's nice. Because they're being multiplied. But we do have a problem still. So what's this equal to and what's that equal to? Hmm. Maybe Mathematica can figure it out for us. Can I get mathematics to evaluate a sum like that? Yes, you can. On um, one of the pallets, like the writing assistant, you can press the summation button and put your cursor on these blocks here. I equals one, I'm just tabbing over to each cell here, to N of I. I'm adding, what, is, what does this mean? It means I'm adding one, then two, then three, then four, then five, et cetera. I is first one, then it's two, then it's three. I'm adding the first n numbers together here. That's what I'm doing. Does that have a simple formula? Amazingly, it does. n times n plus one over two is what it equals. This is n times n plus one over two. We're trusting Mathematica. That's actually a pretty famous formula. And there's a story of one of the greatest mathematicians ever, Carl Gauss, who figured out this formula when he was like in kindergarten. The uh, teacher, the story goes, the teacher, teacher was punishing all the pupils and made them add together the first thousand numbers, or maybe it was a hundred numbers, first hundred numbers say. And Gauss did it in his head in a couple seconds, wrote it on his slate and brought it up. And basically Gauss derived this formula in his head. And if n is 100, you get 100 times 101 over two, which is 50 times 101, which is 5,050. The sum of the first 100 numbers is 5,050. Gauss is a five-year-old, did that in his head in a few seconds. Um, there's actually a very fun derivation of this fact. I'd encourage you to look it up, I mean, I'm serious. It's, it's a really cool little derivation. I think you'll enjoy it actually. 
how to derive that formula. What about the other one with the I squared? Well, let's see if Mathematica can do that one. I goes from one to N of I squared. And amazingly, it can. It's that. n times n plus one times two n plus one over six. Do I expect you to know these formulas for these tests? No. Though if I gave them to you, you should be able to use them. Once again, in each one of these, one of the n's cancels. So this all simplifies down to 12 plus Let's see, 36 over two is 18. I still have a factor of n plus one on top and an n on the bottom. Looks like I got 18 times n plus one over n, if I did not make a mistake. One of the n's cancels, 36 divided by two is 18. I think that's right. And then this, this one, 27 divided by six, is the same as nine halves. I could write a nine and n plus one, and a two n plus one over 2n squared here. One of the n's canceled. 27 sixth is the same as 9 halves. Still have the n plus 1 and the 2n plus 1. I still have an n squared in the bottom there. Let's see if we plug in n equals 4, if this gives us the same answer we got before. If n equals 4, What does this equal? It'll be 12 plus 18 times 5 over 4 plus 9 times 5 times, and there's 4 here. 2 times 4 plus 1 is 9 over 2 times 4 squared. 2 times 4 squared <clears throat> uh, is 32. Looks like I need a common denominator of 32 here. Twelve times thirty-two is three hundred and eighty-four. I've got eighteen times five is ninety. To get a common denominator of 32, I need to multiply the top and the bottom by another eight, because four times eight is 32. 90 times eight is 720. This one already has a denominator of 32. 81 times five is 405. If I've not made a mistake, it's like I have 1,509 divided by 32. 47.15625. That what we got before? Yes, it was. 47.15625. We got the same thing. Good. Yay. I'm so happy. Which way is easier? Looks like this way is easier. However, even though this way is easier, it's not as good for generalizing as I'm about to do. I can use this RHHS formula right here. I can use this no matter what n is. I can use that for any n. Something else I can do with, it, do with that is I can take a limit of that as n goes to infinity. And I hope it's intuitive that the more rectangles you use and the skinnier they get, the better the approximation to the area is going to be. If I take a limit, well, let's, put, let's go ahead and claim it's the exact area and the exact answer for that area is going to be a limit as n goes to infinity of the right-hand sum. Of n. A limit as n goes to infinity of all this stuff right here. 
That's not as hard as it looks. That's a constant, doesn't depend on n. That's going to give you 12. What about this one? As n goes to infinity, what's that going to approach? It's a rational function with the degree of the top and the bottom are the same. What does it approach as n gets larger and larger? Nope. Is 18 over n? 18 over, you're close, not over n. One? Over one. Look at the coefficients of those highest powers, 18 and one. You don't see the one, of course, but it's there. That approach is 18. And this one, the degree of the top and the bottom are the same as well, n squared. The coefficient of n squared, careful, is not nine, it's nine times two is 18. Coefficient of two down, uh, n squared down here is two. This approach is 18 over two, nine as n goes to infinity. So I claim the final answer exactly is 39. I claim that's the exact area under the graph. Is it really right? Let's confirm it with the fundamental theorem of calculus. I did hint at what the fundamental theorem of calculus was last week. The exact area Symbolically, we're going to write as what's called a definite integral, which does involve an integral sign. It does involve writing your function here, x squared dx. However, unlike an indefinite integral, we don't just say, hey, the answer is one third x cubed plus c. In fact, the answer is not one third x cubed plus c. This is not going to be an indefinite integral. I have limits of integration, which are the a and the b two and five. This is my f of x. What the fundamental theorem of calculus says to do to calculate this exact area, to calculate this definite integral is to compute capital F of x from two to five, which means capital F of five minus capital F of two, where, what is this capital F thing? Where, Capital F is an antiderivative of little f. Capital F prime of x always equals little f of x for all x. So for us, that means we can take capital F of x in this example to be one third x cubed. You don't need a plus c though because you only need one antiderivative. Plug the numbers in, I get five cubed over three minus two cubed over three. That's 125 minus eight over three. That's 117 over three and hey, that's 39. not an accident that we got the same answer. This equality right here is the fundamental theorem of calculus, FTC. This symbolism right here, where I put this capital F of X, which is an antiderivative of little f, and I put the, a vertical line with the A and the B here and here, is by definition mean is just shorthand notation for this difference. It's a little strange, but that's tradition. Some people put it in brackets instead of just one vertical line, but I'm, I'm a little lazy. You know, I just put a little vertical line there. That equality is the definition of this symbol. By this symbol, I mean this entire thing. And check this with Mathematica in the number of ways. One way is we can actually um, put 
program Mathematica to do the general right-hand sum. So let f of x equal x cubed, a equal two, b equal five, delta x as a function of n will be b minus a over n, which is fine to think of it as a function of n. And then if I do right-hand sum of n, I can do the summation i goes from one to n of f of a plus i times delta x. And then times delta x. I, I need that um, extra of n in there because I'm defining delta x to depend on n, which it does. There's what the right hand sum expands out to. If I do a limit of the right hand sum as n goes to infinity, I get um, the wrong answer. Let's see here. Oh, uh, f of x is x squared, squared, not x cubed. There we go, 39. I also, again, this writing assistant can do a definite integral symbol. Right here. Plug in A there, B there, F of X there, DX 39. If I enter an anti antiderivative, capital F of X equals X cubed over three, I can compute <clears throat> F of B minus F of A and get 39 as well. <coughs> This is, I hope you agree, astonishing. What, we can avoid limits? We can just use antiderivatives? <coughs> Who would ever know? Who would ever such a, think of such a thing? I don't have to do all this? Yeah, in the end you don't, but for the moment you do, if I ask you to. Actually, I won't assign a homework problem where you have to show all this work, but on old exams, I have put this work on some exam problems, not that people have to derive every single step, <coughs> but you should be able to give reasons for the steps. What reasons? This is just definition of a right-hand sum. This is just algebra simplifying. More algebra. You could call this algebra two. It's proper, maybe a bit more precisely, you could say properties of summations. More properties of summations as well as given formulas. And I, like I said, you would not need to know these formulas on the test. I would give them to you. We don't have to do all this stuff. We can just use the fundamental theorem of calculus. Let's do another example. Let's say we're trying to find the area under the sine function, where x goes from zero to pi. Of course, the sine function continues. It's periodic with period two pi. But I'm interested in this area right there. Maybe this sine function is my speed. X is time, maybe. If I can find that area, then I'll get the distance traveled. Notationally, I'm trying to evaluate this definite integral here. The definite integral from zero to pi of sine of x dx. So sine is my little f of x. According to the fundamental theorem of calculus, this is capital F of x 
evaluated from zero to pi, which by definition is capital F of pi minus capital F of zero, where capital F is an antiderivative of little f. For all x. In other words, what is capital F of x equal? There's more than one choice. What's the simplest choice? What's an antiderivative of sine? Close. Negative cosine, yeah. Derivative of sine is cosine. Antiderivative of sine is negative cosine plus c, but you can take the c to be zero. When you do definite integrals, you can always take the c to be zero. So this gives plug in pi negative cosine of pi minus negative cosine of zero. Careful about minus signs. Cosine of pi is negative one. Cosine of zero is positive one. The two negatives made it make a plus. The answer is two. Interesting. The area under the sine graph from zero to, two, zero to pi is, is a nice simple whole number, two. Who would ever expect that to be the case? You would think it would like involve pi or something. Let's confirm it. Integrate from zero to pi, sine of x dx, two. One big application besides physics is to probability, like I mentioned. And the construction of something called a probability density function. Suppose f of x equals c over x squared. is a probability density function for some, let's call a continuous random variable oh let's say over the interval from um, one to three. C can't be any old number. C has to be something specific. It's gotta be chosen to make the area under the graph equal to one, it turns out, for it to be a valid probability density function. I haven't explained what probability density functions are yet. I will explain it. We must choose C so that the integral of this function over the interval from one to three has been normalized, so to speak, to equal one. We've got to choose C, so that's the case. That's the way probability density functions work. If you've taken some stats like AP stats or something, and you know about, for example, normal distributions, bell-shaped curves. Those are examples of probability density functions as well. And the total area under them has to equal one. C over X squared is the same as C times X to the negative two. Let's go ahead and integrate that and see how it depends on C. The integral from one to three of c times x to the negative two. I need an antiderivative of c times x to the negative two. 
Hmm. That might take some experimentation. If you experiment enough, you'll find that C, negative C times X to the negative one is an antiderivative. If this is my little f of X, this is my capital F of X. Check it, differentiate that. Bring down the negative one. Negative one times negative one is positive one. C X to the negative two. Negative one minus two, one is negative two. That's an antiderivative. I have just applied the fundamental theorem of calculus that says this integral can be done with this antiderivative evaluation. First plug in three for X and then subtract what you get when you plug in one for X. Careful about minus signs. If I replace x with three, I get negative c at three to the negative one. That's the same as negative c over three minus, gotta have a minus there. What I get when I plug in x equals one. Negative c times one to the negative one is the same as negative c over one. Simplify, this becomes c minus c over three is two c over three. <clears throat> I wanna choose c so this equals one. I want to set this equal to one and solve for C. Well, that's easy. C is three halves. So the upshot of this is F of X equals three halves over X squared, which is the same as three over two X squared is a probability density function. for a continuous random variable. RV means random variable over the interval from one to three. But what does it mean? What's it good for? Well, I'll show this to you on Wednesday that you can get Mathematica to simulate values of this. But I can give you a little intuition here. The graph of this function looks about like this. F of one is three halves, F of three is three over two times three squared is, that'll be one sixth, I think, right? Yeah, one sixth. There's what the graph looks like. And we've just found the area under this curve to be one. Notice this curve is not constant. It, it's a curve, it's decreasing. Its highest values are when X is close to one and its lowest values are when X is close to three. And here's what it represents intuitively. As a model of data, it conceivably could represent a situation where your, where your data values, your random data values are between one and three all the time, mostly close to one and not so many close to three. Now that's a very rough statement. Couldn't there be lots of functions that would have that property where it's high over here and low over there? Yes, there, there could be. So I need to leave it sort of rough for the moment, but that's the basic rough idea is because the graph is higher over here and lower over here, your data is gonna be clustered more in the low values of X compared to the high values. And you can make it more precise as to why this particular function might work. We'll talk about it more. Um, what if your graph goes both above and below the axis? What if, uh, you know, let's go ahead and call it V equals F of T is your velocity at time T. And let's pretend it's a function that can have negative values. 
let's say it's one minus t squared for t between zero and two. <clears throat> what does the definite integral give you in this case? Well, let's just go ahead and compute it. Not thinking about what it might mean, but just compute it based on the FTC and see what we get. So I'm going to integrate this function from zero to two. That means according to the fundamental theorem of calculus, I need an antiderivative of this function, a capital F. If I integrated that function as an indefinite integral, think about it here with me, the integral of one is t. t is the variable here. Integral of t squared would be t cubed over three. The minus sign is just going to be along for the ride. t minus t cubed over three evaluated from zero to two. Plug in the top number, two. Subtract what you get when you plug in the bottom number. Hey, plugging in zero is awful nice. This is just a big fat zero. We ultimately get two minus eight thirds. Six thirds minus eight thirds is negative two thirds. <clears throat> a negative answer. Is it correct? Let's see what Mathematica says. Integrate from zero to two, two parentheses, one minus t squared, dt is negative two thirds. Negative. How does, how is that interpreted? It can't be a distance traveled. Distance traveled has to be positive, right? You can't undo your distance traveled. The graph of this function looks about like this. The answer we got is negative. So the answer can't be an area and it also can't be a distance traveled. However, it's related to those things with twists. Instead of an area under the graph, it's this area under the graph when the graph is above the axis minus this area that is above the graph when the graph is below the x-axis. If I call this area A1 and this area A2, where A1 and A2 are positive, out of about as pure areas, then this answer is really A1 minus A2. You count the areas above the graph when it's below the axis as contributing negatively to the integral. You have to subtract them. What does it mean? What does the negative two thirds mean? What does it represent physically? Anything? It does represent something. Instead of distance traveled, what it represents is change in position. This is a change in position, not distance traveled. And a change in position can be negative. Think about up-down motion, say. Initially, the velocity is positive. That means the motion is upward at first. This is not free fall because it's not an accurate free fall model. Let's just pretend it goes up first in the positive direction. And then at time one is when it reaches the peak and then it starts coming down. It has a negative velocity. The fact that we got a negative answer here in the end means this area A2 in absolute value was bigger than A1. The difference is negative. And it also means <coughs> that we end up below where we started. If upward is positive, the change in position is negative means we ended up below where we started. I'm teaching you the most fundamental things I can think of to teach you about integrals here today. 
All this stuff is super fundamental. Um, though the limits are harder than we typically gonna do. Let me end class by just showing you something else in the book to pay attention to. And you should be able to use on the next assignment. In the very first section of chapter five, the last page of that section, you see this picture? Notice that that function is decreasing, not increasing. Notice that the um, tall rectangles, at least, form what's called the left-hand sum. The tall rectangles meaning including the darker shading and the lighter shading. Because for each one of these sub intervals, like the second one here, to get the tall rectangle, go to the left endpoint instead of the right endpoint and go up to the graph, and that'll be the height of your rectangle. <coughs> when the function is decreasing like this, the left hand sums are too big, and the right hand sums, which are just the dark ones, are too small. The lightly shaded area is not one rectangle, it's a bunch of rectangles, but you could squeeze them all together stack them to get one single rectangle representing the difference between the left and right hand sums. <coughs> that rectangle right there is made up of these other five rectangles all stacked together. And its base is delta t because all of these bases have delta t and its height is f of b minus f of a in absolute value. In this picture, f of a, b is this distance, f of a is this distance, <coughs> f of a is bigger than f of b here. But if you take the absolute value of the difference, that's the height. And that is therefore, that product of these two things is therefore the difference between the upper and lower estimates. It simplifies to this. You should know this for your homework. Let's just quickly give you an idea how to use it. Use it for a problem like number 15. Roger runs a marathon, keeping track of his different speeds as time goes by. Roger's getting tired because he's going slower and slower. You're supposed to estimate how far Roger went. So you're trying to estimate the integral by, here we don't have a formula, we only have data. We have to do summations here. When you only have data, you have to do a summation. A left hand sum is going to be too big, and a right hand sum is going to be too small because the function, the speed is decreasing here. It's kind of like this graph. Part C says, How often would Jeff have needed to measure Roger's speed instead of every 15 minutes in order to have, find lower and upper estimates within point one of the actual distance? Meaning, within point one of each other as well. You want to set what was on that previous page, the absolute value of f of b minus f of a times delta t in this case, set that equal to point one and solve for delta t. Time is in minutes here. A is zero, B is 90. This is the absolute value of F of 90 minus F of zero. We don't know delta T here, we need to solve for it. F of 90 is 12, F, or F of zero is 12, F of 90 is zero. This is a 12 here. Delta T would have to be 0.1 divided by 12. 0.1 divided by 12. is 0 0.0083 repeating. Time is measured in minutes. Jeff would have to measure his speed every that often minutes to figure out answers that are within 0.1 of the true distance traveled. 
This is the distance between the upper and lower estimates. If they're within 0.1 of each other, they're gonna also be within 0.1 of the true answer. That's not very long here. You could convert that to seconds by multiplying by 60, about every half second. 0 0.5 seconds. So I got when I multiplied by 60. Okay. So that's what you want to do to, to answer a question like this is you want to set, you want to solve for delta T to make this distance between the upper and lower estimates equal to 0.1 in that case. Okay. All right. Have a good day.